Good morning. I'm Reverend Art Moore, and I'm the pastor at Centenary United Methodist Church in Louisiana, Missouri, and Clarksville United Methodist Church in Clarksville, Missouri. We're coming to you this morning from the sanctuary at Centenary United Methodist Church. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I just have a couple of announcements I'd like to make this morning before we start in. Facebook and YouTube will be continuing on a weekly basis. We've, you'll notice this week that we changed our time and we will be starting at 11 o'clock instead of our 10 o'clock time. And this is because we are starting our services at 11 o'clock and we will have the possibility of live, live streaming our actual Sunday service, which we hope will start next Sunday or sometime in the near future when we can get that all worked out. Well, this morning, I've asked one of our children's Sunday school teachers, Miss Vicki, to present the children's moment. And we'd like to welcome Miss Vicki this morning. Good morning, everyone. Happy Memorial Day weekend. We'd like to thank all those who have served. Today, I brought a special guest with me, my great niece, Ava Barbano. She's going to share the children's service time with me. Today, we'd like to talk to you about another special day in the church. Does anyone know what Ascension Sunday is? It doesn't sound very familiar like Christmas or Palm Sunday or Easter, does it? The word ascend means to go upward. So let's find out what it means. Up, up, and away. The celebration of Ascension takes place 40 days after Easter. Jesus rose from the grave. After appearing to his disciples, he ascended into heaven. Here's a picture of what it may have looked like. That's who went up, Jesus. Why is this important? The Ascension reminds us of who Jesus was and also shows the importance of how he has gone to prepare a place for us in heaven. Jesus gave some special promises before he went up to be with God the Father. He promised that he would return in the same way someday. Have you ever gotten separated from your parents in a store or a crowded place? Maybe you were distracted by looking at something in the toy aisle, and when you looked up, your family was gone? That would be pretty scary, and you would feel like you had been abandoned. For a few minutes, you couldn't find your family, and you probably were really scared. As soon as you were reunited with your family, you would be so relieved that you were not really left alone. Jesus' disciples followed him for three years. They heard him teach and saw him do many miracles. When they saw him nailed to the cross and die, they may have been scared and felt like they were left alone. Even though Jesus' friends had been told by Jesus what to expect, they were probably frightened when those things really took place. Sometimes feelings of fear or sadness can cloud our hearts to the truth that Jesus has spoken to us from his word. When we have feelings that seem to overwhelm us and we need to find out the truth uh, from reading God's word. To prove that Jesus was really alive and not a figment of the disciples' imaginations, Jesus stayed on the earth for 40 whole days after his resurrection. Luke tells us in Acts 1-3 that over those 40 days, Jesus gave many people convincing proof of his resurrection. God's plan for Jesus was to return to heaven. Jesus had chosen his apostles to be messengers for him after he left. When Jesus finished instructing the apostles, his feet lifted off the ground and he began to ascend or go up into the sky. He disappeared into the clouds. In this story, the disciples watched Jesus go up into heaven. We don't see Jesus from day to day, but we know that he's still here and loves us. Because of that, we should also love one another and tell others about Jesus as we wait for his eventual return. Thank you. 
thank you, Father, for bringing us together to worship you today and to learn more about the church. Amen. Well, we'd just like to say thank you to Miss Keeley and Ava for joining us today and giving us some information about the ascension of Jesus, where now he is sitting at the right hand of God up in heaven. We'd like to sing a song at, the, at this time, it's Crown Him With Many Crowns, and that's found in your hymnal, if you happen to have one at home, and the United Methodist hymnal on page number 327. And we're going to sing the first and the fourth verse. Crown him with many crowns, the Lamb upon his throne. Hark how the heavenly anthem drowns, all music but its own. Awake my soul and sing. Of him who died for thee, and hail him as the matchless king through all eternity. Crown him the Lord of love, the old his hands and side, those wounds yet visible above. Thank you for that fine singing and joining your voices in as we sing wonderful praises to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My sermon this morning is going to be Be Prepared, which comes from 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 through 11. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 through 11. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be alert and sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him. Stand firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. This is the Sunday when we as Christians celebrate the ascension of Jesus Christ. After Jesus had eaten a meal with his disciples, they went outside as the disciples gathered around Jesus. At the conclusion of a discussion between the disciples and Jesus, God the Father took Jesus in his resurrection body from this world to his rightful place at the right hand of God. We can read about this in Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 11, and you can also find it in Luke chapter 24, verses 44 through 53. In Acts 1, verse 9, it says, After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight, just like what we saw in the children's sermon this, this day with those balloons rising up and then disappearing. We also read in Luke chapter 24, verses 52 and 53, that, and they, the disciples, worshipped him and returned to Jesus with great joy and were continually in the temple, praising and blessing God. Reading these accounts of Jesus' ascension in Luke and Acts brought up a few, not really questions, 
but positive remarks or insights that really blessed me. And I'm just going to go over a couple of them with you today, not the three or five or six that really stood out to me. But in Acts chapter 1, verse 4, it says, while Jesus was eating with them. You know, this shows that Jesus was still in his human body, still man. He was eating with them. This just provides additional proof of Jesus' bodily resurrection. And in Acts 1, 9, it says, And a cloud hid him from their sight. This is just a visible reminder that God's glory was present at this, as the apostles watched the ascension. For some of them, this was not the first time that they had witnessed Jesus' divine glory. In Mark chapter 9, verse 26, Jesus cast out an evil spirit, which showed his divine glory, his divine power. Neither will this be the last time clouds accompany Jesus. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 7, it says, Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him even those who pierced him, and all peoples on earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. Of the 300 visions and promises from God through his prophets in the Old Testament, we are informed that he would send the Messiah, and these are the things that this Messiah will do from where he will be born to all he will do and provide through his life on earth until his ascension into heaven. That is mentioned in Psalm 68, verse 18, which says, You have ascended on high. Jesus, the Messiah, has fulfilled each of those 300 promises and statements in the Old Testament throughout his lifetime, he fulfilled those promises. There are nearly 1,000 prophecies from the Bible, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, that tell of Jesus' second coming, which says he is coming again. We saw the 300 promises and prophecies fulfilled now there's a thousand other prophecies that we will see fulfilled in the near future. If you have any doubts about this taking place, Jesus said in Revelation that was written by John the Revelator, and in the last chapter, it says, Revelation chapter 22 and verse 7 and verse 12 and in verse 20, it says, Look, I am coming soon. Again, it said, look, I am coming soon. And yes, I am coming soon. What a joy to know that in the last book and the last chapter of the Bible, God's holy scripture, we are told three times that Jesus is coming back to earth. Peter is telling us in our scripture reading here to be prepared. In verses 5 and 6 of 1 Peter, it says, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. Look at that word, humble. Humility. It is not considered to be a virtue in the ancient world any more than it is a virtue for us today. The humble who faithfully submit to him and trust his purpose, trust his power, and trust his providences have no cause for distressing anxiety, the sin of worry. Our reliance is in him to whom belongs our care. God watches everything that concerns us. Can you believe that? has all things under his control, and God is not forgetful. 
Verse 7 tells us that he cares for you. Wow. Do you hear what Peter is telling us? This verse assures us that we are Jesus's personal concern. Yes, we are followers of Jesus. Those who have accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior have become his child. We still are required to be watchful against temptation and to bear our share of personal responsibilities. We as Christians must alert. We must remain alert as we are warned in verse 8. Be alert and sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. A roaring lion is bloodthirsty. He's violent and insatiable for prey, always on the prowl, seeking whom he may devour. This crafty foal is eyeing all the Christians, you and me, in turn to see which he has the best chance of swallowing up both soul and body, moving any one of us away from the family of God. Now the question comes to mind, what am I to do against the devil? It just brings back that saying that goes around, the devil made me do it. Our own wisdom is insufficient and cowering in fear leads to our defeat. Our way to overcome is right before our eyes in Scripture. Verse 9 here in 1 Peter chapter 5 says, Resist him, standing firm in the faith. Our faith in God. We can overcome the devil by putting our complete reliance on God as the great deliverer, by maintaining unshaken trust in divine aid, and by undeviating loyalty, undeviating loyalty to Christ. Jesus is the way. The problem of suffering has baffled philosophers and theologians through the centuries. Job wondered why the righteous suffered. David was perplexed by this problem. It baffled each of Christ's disciples, and it perplexes believers today. I accepted Jesus as my Savior, and I live my faith for him. Shouldn't I live my life in a rose garden? Shouldn't I have a long and never dying life? Well, we've seen just recently this past week, Ravi Zacharias, who was one of the greatest apologists of our time, passed by a, through a sudden case of cancer at the young age of 74. He gave talks and lectures all around the world to some leaders of many nations and at some of the most prestigious universities in our nation. Yet, even though he is gone, his ministry will carry on through the organization and the individuals that he mentored. You know, our sufferings and our trials will allow God to use them for a testimony of his deliverance in our lives. God may have chosen us to demonstrate his grace and his power. Suffering produces a unity with and a nearness to God that cannot come otherwise. It enlarges our life and teaches us sympathy 
for other sufferers. Above all, it teaches that the cost was great for our redemption. We need to allow God to take control of our hearts, to live in our heart, that the only desire of our life then is to please God. Through the second work of grace, the grace of entire sanctification, the Holy Spirit will dwell within us. That is why when Jesus ascended into heaven, that God sent the Holy Spirit to live within our heart. Let us pray. Lord, may the total desire of my heart, of my soul, and of my total being be for you only. I ask you, God, to cleanse my heart of all sinful desire. I ask and I surrender to you, God, my life. God, I yearn for all of you, that you will lead my life, make the desire of my heart to be more and more of you. Lord, I pray that you will sanctify me, cleanse my heart, take my life and let it be, consecrated all for you and you only. Send your Holy Spirit to live in my heart. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. I'd just like to mention that next week the service will be sent out again for 11 o'clock in the morning. We rejoice with those that have joined in fellowship with us today in person and over the airwaves. And I'd just like to close our time together. Looking forward to seeing you all again next week as we worship our Lord together with a benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. May the Lord bless you this day and in the week to come.